So this week's about theory, but I don't take um, my lectures from the book because I figure that you probably get a lot from the book or from the internet or whatever. So what I do is I find a good article um, online. Uh, it's free. You can go to the SVSU library on the web page. You just log in. Your tuition pays for this. Maybe you don't know that. But uh, we have subscriptions here through the library, which is coincidentally right there, to academic journals. And I just found a good one that I thought was pretty broad, pretty basic. And it's from, in fact, a journal called Sociological Theory. So there you go, right? And um, it was also from the first edition. So you'd think they're starting a journal in 1983 called Sociological Theory. The first couple articles are going to probably be relatively broad. Relatively, no pun intended. Um, so this one was pretty good. It talks a lot about Durkheim, but uh, I'm doing like your stuff. I'm doing theory. We're going to come at it from different perspectives. I also teach on Mondays an intro class at Delta College down the street. And um, last night they did one. We're, we do the same stuff, so I have to repeat myself a lot. Um, and the first students that presented, outstanding. So they set the bar very high for you. And it's, this is your competitor down the road. You're all going to graduate together and enter the job market. So they've got it going on. So you guys have to, you know, show what's up with the red pride, right? The Prezi thing, that'll probably do good there. Their uh, presentation involved symbolic interactionism, conflict theory, and functionalism. Any of you doing those things? Yeah? Oh. It's very common. And like I told them, uh, I specifically don't lecture out of the book because I kind of think you do. And this is a sociological experiment, sort of, in that it's really shifting the paradigm for education. That your information, you used to get only from me, right? Back 10, 20 years ago, students come to the lecture to get the information from the professor. Oh, professor, teach me these great things, right? But now, um, those same slideshows that would have happened 10, 20 years ago about conflict theory, functionalism, and symbolic interactionism, game theory maybe, um, and network theory, you're teaching the class. So the whole thing is shifted because the information is now available to you in a lot of different ways. In fact, information has kind of been democratized as we will we'll learn more about what democratized and democracy means with a small d, not Democrats, um, throughout the semester. But now you have the access to information, so you have a lot more power than you used to 10, 20 years ago as students. Um, in the past, you used to come here sort of in need of the information from me, but now you all have it, and I just give you extra information. So the, the fact is, students today are coming out so much smarter than when I came out. So. The fact that you're going to school now instead of 15 years ago, it's actually you're getting a better quality education. It's amazing. I mean, I remember when I was in college, and we were right around the same age as far as college goes, pretty close. And uh, I remember being in class, and uh, you know, I didn't even, we didn't have online journals. I never read a journal article. And now you'll all be reviewing six journal articles for your midterm. It's all just so available, and your books are online. You know, I had to go buy books. You had to buy books back in the day. Now your books are free and online. And, and back in the day, no professor ever lectured from note cards that he had on his smartphone. Um, since I'm thinking about when I was in college, I, did, I will tell you um, just a, a very brief anecdote about my experience with September 11th. I, I was actually in class on the morning of September 11th. I was in a class called religion and revolution the, when the the planes hit the towers I was in a class called religion and revolution and it was really impactful for me because it was at that point in my life I think I really started realizing how important education was because here I am in a, one of the most life-changing events for America you know in the past as long as I can remember and um, it was based a lot on you know religion um, even if it wasn't specifically a Muslim, you know, dictate, um, the countries over there are heavily based on Islam, 
And like here, all of our presidents have been Protestant Christian, except for one. Does anyone know who that was? JFK. So even though our religion's not necessarily based on religion, we have Christianity embedded in our leaders and somewhat in our constitution. And so over there, they have the same thing with Islam. And so to be in a class called Religion and Revolution, when an attack like that was happening, country on country, which was related to religion and a revolution, I thought, you know, this is really appropriate. A really important place to be is at school. Sometimes you can look at school as like math class and this boring English class uh, talking about Shakespeare that you don't like and will never read again. But what you should really do is grab onto these opportunities like this nine o'clock thing where you go and you recognize the world we live in. So it's a very important um, thing to do when you're in college. And that was very, you know, obviously 9-11 is a big impact, but to be sitting in a class called Re Religion and Revolution when that happened, it's just, it's like, this is really the place where we should be. So I'm going to continue to be here as long as they'll <coughs> hire me. Don't necessarily have to get paid. Our first slide is about Durkheim. So the article is about Durkheim's paradigm. And a paradigm is a model. It's a way of representing something. So Durkheim's paradigm is just his model or his idea of how the world is modeled socially. And the first, f first words on the slideshow is man is double. And what he's pointing out in the dualism of man is the biological organism and also the social being. And so these are two distinct and different things. Who can just give me, this is intro, this is really basic, There's, it's hard to get this wrong. Who can tell me what the biological organism portion of man is? What does that mean to you? Well, as to say, the man, man is part social being and part biological organism. What's the biological organism? Physical body. So that is your head, and it even includes your thoughts, because they're inside there, right? You think. Um, and, uh, you know, from head to toe, this is your physical body. So man is a, is a biological organism, but it's also a social being. And what does that mean? What are some examples of how a man can be a social being, which is totally separate from the biological? What does that mean? Yeah, you hang out with friends. You can't do that by yourself. You can't hang out with friends. You could. No, you can't. Oh, how would you? Yeah, you'd also be in a rubber room, probably. <laughs> but, yeah, you can't hang out with friends by yourself. E even if you're online, locked, in a w locked away in a room, if you're online on Facebook or something, you're still interacting with friends, even though they're sort of su superficial. You can't be in a group unless there are other people. So there's a social being. You here as part of this group is your being socially. It has nothing to do with your physicality. Um, so, you know, that's, that's how Durkheim looked at people. The biological, physical, and the social. Um, student last night, smart, smart guy, smart guy. I won't call him a kid. But uh, I, I said, what are there some ways that you can interact socially? And he said, uh, last night he said, you can communicate. And that was a really great thing to say, communication. Because you can't hang out with friends if you're by yourself. And you can't communicate, you know, unless there are two points on the two nodes in this little network. You can have a two-person network, but there's no communication unless there's somebody to communicate with. So if I was walking around campus talking to myself, I'm not communicating to anyone. If nobody can hear me, it's this tree falls in, a, in the woods sort of thing. Like If you're talking, if you're writing letters and nobody receives it, that's not communication. That, that could be writing or whatever. But Communication, so you want to think about this, is communication totally social? Or can communication happen within the physical body? But Jerry Kahn would say it's social. Okay, so again, the two parts, organic and social. And Jerry Kahn believes that human behavior is a system of specialized functions which define relationship. So a function of eating falls under which category? The physical, biological. And a function of uh, communication falls under which category? Okay. Um, so can anyone think of other, this is, and this is so easy, but we had to just start thinking this way, uh, other social interactions or activities, like anything. 
work. Uh, yeah, so you're at a job and your job is to paint, okay? Everything comes from you and you put it onto uh, a piece of paper. It's rather individualistic until what? You take it to a gallery, right? Yeah. But if your work is uh, working at McDonald's and you make food, it might have a tinge of biological in there because you're influencing people's actual physical bodies. But more so, the engagement is social. So you could actually, and all of you can do this too, Durkheim, so he's this famous sociologist, and I start saying, we have this physical, we have this social. But if you think otherwise, if you think, oh, work, yeah, that's social, but wait a minute, it's physical because you serve hamburgers, which make people obese, et cetera, et cetera, then you could actually argue against Durkheim, and that's totally fine. For this class, that's totally fine. If I say something that's supposedly true, and you disagree, I mean, totally take it and run with it, okay? Um, now, this is the reason why I did the Kurt Cobain thing. How did Kurt Cobain leave the world? Say that louder? Suicide. Suicide. And so Durkheim's big book is called Suicide. And he, he wrote a huge book about suicide. And his theory was that man was separate, biological and social. Why did he pick suicide to write about? Does anyone have any ideas off the top of your head? Suicide is really, it's really deep when you start to think about, is it physical or is it social? Does anyone here have any thoughts about suicide being physical or social? I'll just get you going. Sometimes the classes erupt and people have real deep thoughts on them, real close to themselves. Maybe they had a loved one commit suicide. Some people will think suicide's completely Biological, a lot of times it's going to be a psychologist that will say, look, this guy's brain had produced extra chemicals which made him super sad, so he killed himself. But other people, like a sociologist, will say he was in a family. His family put stress on him in the form of financial and emotional and social stressors. So if this guy never would have got married, he would never have killed himself because he would have been partying all single, living it up, you know, hanging out, just, you know, going to school when he was, you know, older guy, just partying, man. So, but if he would have got married, he may, maybe would have killed himself. So that's the sociologist's perspective, but the, the psychologist is gonna say it's all in your head. So give me some of your thoughts, because some of you have to have some sort of opinion on it. almost like triggers. Yeah. But at the same time, no matter how many triggers he's got, the marriage triggered it, perhaps. Had he not got married, that whole stress thing about, oh, the, my wife being mean to me is gonna trigger something and my kids yelling is gonna trigger something to me on that Thursday night in 1985. You know, had he not had that social surrounding, maybe that trigger would have never went off. Maybe a lot of us have those triggers biologically but because we get to chill out on the lawn and nothing's going wrong and we're having Starbucks and all this, like, it's all, it's all hunky-dory. What do you think? By the way, who has my coffee speaking of Starbucks? <laughs> Jeez, I'm gonna fall asleep if I don't have it. There could, so that's the whole idea of maybe we all have triggers and we're all, we could all get depressed. And it's, so you're in her camp then, this whole combination thing? Yeah. So Durkheim's trying to split them and you guys are trying to bring them together. I think strength in numbers, we could beat Durkheim. He's dead anyways, I mean. <laughs> Biologically, as human beings, we are supposed to be social. So she's saying biologically, we're supposed to be social. What evidence is there of that? What do you think? I can think of a couple right off the bat. What do you think? Well, that goes along with like, the kids who are isolated and probably don't grow up and like, have developmental issues. They need love and comfort. Like, 
there's a monkey that would go to the cloth club or she would wire around and go to wire around. <laughs> so she, what she's saying is we could do experiments on kids even, babies. It's totally <laughs> messing. We would never pass clearance on that study. <laughs> And you grow these babies, grow the babies, <laughs> and you put them in a room, and all you do is give them bread and water, and it's all just white walls and it's closed, no windows, right? Yep. Another kid, you put them in a daycare with all these party animals and all these toys and Nintendo Wii's, and then when they're 18, you open up the doors, and the six kids that were all isolated, they're gonna start like shooting each other, not literally, because they wouldn't know what guns are, but they'll be depressed and they might be sad. And they might actually get so depressed that after five years in regular society, they kill themselves. And the other kids who are very socialized might not kill themselves. But, but, I have, and we might all agree too that that would happen, okay? Let's just assume that we say, yeah, all those kids that came out isolated, they'd be totally messed up and they might get depressed and kill themselves. So let's all agree that that's the case. But. What is a determining factor there besides the controls of the exper experiment? So you've got kids and you put them in the room and you isolate them. And you've got other kids and you socialize them. And then you let them out. What are they going into? What type of world are they going into? A very socialized world, right? Where we have classrooms, an institution of a university with 40,000 students. We have churches where religion is very social. We have families. Everyone's expected to get married and have kids. So the kids that come out of isolation, they come out and they're like, no, I'm all right, but what's going on here? Why is everyone in groups of four? Why is everyone in groups of 30? Why when I go to a restaurant are people all sitting at tables together? I'm completely abnormal and maybe that will cause their depression because there is a, a norm and a deviance and so the isolated kids would come out as deviants totally different abnormal than general society whereas the socialized kids are coming out and they're going hey 30 kids in a class I'm totally used to this let's rock out let's party let's go what's something they said last night YOLO <laughs> YOLO so um, you could, you could flip that experiment and you could release the isolated kids to the tops of mountains and continue to isolate them and see if uh, any of them committed suicide then. You know, if you're totally isolated your entire life, where would you even get the idea of suicide? Someone who thinks suicide is extremely social on that end of the spectrum um, might say that suicide wouldn't exist if there weren't social pressures. Would say that if you isolated somebody their entire life, they'd have no idea of, social, of suicide because suicide is a, it's a social force, a social fact, a social condition that is invented by people. What are some other concepts that certain folks argue are totally invented by people? I'm thinking of one. Who said that? Racism? How, how do you mean that? Even if they're different, they don't care. They don't really notice it. What if you put um, some kids into a room and uh, one of the kids' face was totally burned off? Or I've seen this before, actually. Um, a woman whose face was completely concave and had amputated arms and legs. Do you think that they would notice that? What if that person couldn't talk? Would that make it more of a, or would they totally be like, nothing's, nothing's different here. Everything's just fine. I can't talk to this person with a concave face and no arms and no legs. Everything's cool. Who, who thinks that, they, that the kids would probably say there's something going on here? And why would they think that? Because they know what they look like. They don't look like that. Because they don't look like that. So I would talk about racism, and I'm not arguing against what you're saying, but I would say racism is not based on black or white. 
I, I, this is editorial from Girdwood, that I think um, racism, if you get a, 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 a white racist guy that hates black people, I don't think that he necessarily hates black people. I think that he hates something that's different than him. Anything that's different than him. So racism, I think, is born out of this idea of the, the self and the other. This is a sociological concept. I'm not just like preaching here, right? I'm trying to teach you about the whole concept of self and other. So if you had a theory about racism and you believed in the self and other, you might have an experiment where everyone was the same race and try to figure out ways that they were different and ask them if that, or experience and, and record whether or not the differences caused any conflict. And maybe your um, theory would be based on conflict theory, which you may teach us about next week. So I would, I would expect that even in, I think, a couple generations when we all start uh, having babies that are interracial and a couple more generations when we're all the same race. Racism, as that word, I think will be gone, but I think there will still be other ways that people find differences. Gender will probably still be there. Height, weight, um, athleticism, um, education level, money, these things might still remain even if we've eliminated race. So there's a potential that people just grab onto race-ism because that's the easiest way for these people who are super against the other to see it. It's visibly, it's right there. Gender is the same way. It's like if you're looking for something to hate that's different than you, you just look around and you find something that looks very, very different and you start hating on that. That's why I presented that whole concave face, no arms, no legs things because I'm trying to think of the most different thing that a kid might see. Whereas race might be disappearing now. That might not be seen as that big of a difference as it once was. Because race itself, it's not that big of a difference. Skin color is really just skin color, but historically there's been a difference. Historically, certain races have been enslaved or currently, if you look at the rates of incarceration, it's terrible. Or if you look at poverty rates, it's terribly the, I'll just use a phrase from the Democratic National Convention, don't hate on me, but um, it's a game and the game is rigged, perhaps, maybe it's not, but the Democratic National Convention said it was. The game is rigged that some people just, statistics back it up, just the outcome is a certain way and that's one of the reasons why I teach sociology because I'm trying to level the playing field be it race or poverty or crime. And right now, statistically, the incarceration rates are sick. So if, if any of you guys are criminal justice majors, you know, I'd encourage you to find those statistics because they're sick. Don't get me started. <laughs> so suicide, back to that. Remembering, Durkheim wrote this big book talking about is it physical or social behavior. Durkheim, one of his big things was time of year. And so he looked at the seasons. So if it was like winter, you know, he'd look at, he was a quantitative sort of guy, even though he was a theorist. He said, it's winter. Do people kill themselves more often in winter? If so, why? It's summer. Do people kill themselves less often in summer? Maybe, yeah, because they're out golfing a lot and they're having a good time. So why should you kill yourself in the summer? Um, so that's what Durkheim looked at. Um, if any of you are really interested in family um, studies or if you're like future social workers, you can think about studying birth rates and you can even match it up with times of the year. My, uh, so I try to make this, this is a real sociological point, but I try to make it as light as possible and politically correct because it, keep it PG in this class. But um, my boss right now, uh, she's pregnant and she's going to have her baby on, or the due date is February 14th. So she says that's a love child because it's due on February 14th. But I said to my boss, I said, really, the real love child is my little brother because he was born on November 15th, which is nine months from Valentine's Day or the day after Valentine's Day. 
But truthfully, I say that because it's true, but also it's kind of a lighthearted way of saying birth rates change throughout the year. And they also change throughout the decade. And they also change throughout the century. So if you have interest in population rising or falling or family studies, and you want to start study birth rates, if you think that the high birth rate in America is a bad thing or a good thing, or if you're a poli-sci major and you want to look at China and how they handle birthing uh, compared to America or compared to uh, countries in uh, Europe or Africa, I would encourage you to do that. It's really interesting stuff and it's fun stuff. I think it's fun. You do a study and you find out more people are born on November 15th than any other day or something like that or November 14th or whatever. Um, and the same thing is true with seasons. You know, maybe it's winter and people are cooped up or maybe it's summer and they get out. Another thing that can be equated or I should say correlated to seasons would be crime. If you look at Flint, for example, um, there's going to be a lot more murders in the summer. And why, do, why is that? Or what are some theories behind that? Some hypotheses? The heat just gets people mad because poor people probably don't have air conditioning like me. I go home and just play video games in my air conditioning. But if you're in poverty in the summer, you go home, it's hot, you start to get angry. Right? Am I right? People stay out later because the sun's up longer. So it's nicer longer, so they're outside longer in the year. The more murders. Yeah. Why else? Is there more access to guns? Kids are out of school and they have nothing to keep them busy. Maybe there is higher unemployment rates in the summer too. Or people take the summers off and they have nothing better to do than shoot each other. <laughs> it's sad, it's sad. So I would encourage you to study that if you're interested in crime, crime rates. So Durkheim's par paradigm, again, there are two other different things. There's a different paradigm. Social relationships and collective representation. So a social relationship, let's talk about the birth rate thing. The social relationship is the two partners who have the child. The collective would be the national birth rate. So you can either study from a micro level, an interaction between two people, or you can look at a macro level and you can look at collective elements um, of the entire group, product or outcome. So you can look at that. Thinking about social relationships as between individuals or between an individual and an institution. Um, can anyone, anyone study the syllabus or a chapter one and tell me what some of our institutions are that we're going to study later in this class? What's that? Yeah, government, totally, that's on the list too. Family, that is also number one on the list. What are some other ones? Religion, good. Not on the list, but should be. Other ones? Education, and I have down the market or the economy. So um, there are social relationships like we have. I'm the professor, you're the student. But there's also social relationships that we have connected to institutions, like the school. I have a relationship to the school. They pay me, I have to be here, blah, blah, blah. But I have a relationship with you too, on this level, and you have an, uh, a relationship with the institution as well, different than mine. So you can just think about it like that. Very basic idea, it's week two. Collective representations are common ideas that form meaning through an examination of people's experience in society. So just knowing that collective representations are based on people's behaviors uh, as an aggregate. And when you study people's behavior as an aggregate, that's sociology. If you study behavior at more of an individual level, that's psychology. So what we're doing is we're trying to make broad sweeping ideas about society in general based on behavior. Um, so. I could give many examples, but I think you get that one. When Durkheim looked at suicide, 
he had four four things that were on this chart that's a on the slide that's really great but you don't get to see egoism which is self selfishness so you could have uh, suicide for an egotistical reason uh, altruistic um, which is selflessness like if you volunteer or donate to charity you're altruistic so think about these think remember that I'm talking about Durkheim's outlook on suicide an egoist suicide is somebody only cares about themselves where they're like I don't care about any of you guys I'm just really upset and I'm gonna end this so that I don't have to suffer any longer that might be an egotistical suicide but then an altruistic suicide is someone that would say I'm no good for my family I'm screwing everything up for them and I can't make enough money for them they'd be much better off if I killed myself and they got the insurance money they'd live better that would be an altruistic suicide. He also had anami, which is chance, lawlessness, and a lack of social and ethical standards. So an anomic suicide is somebody that just really, just kind of, almost the sort of who cares idea. Like, it doesn't matter. I don't really care about my family. I don't care about me. It's pretty much, uh, I don't have any connection to the world. I don't have any responsibilities, so I'll just end my life. That would be an anomic suicide. And then there's the fatalist. That's almost like the nihilist that believes that all events are predetermined. So that person would say, well, either they could either say, this would not be a nihilist, but they could either say it's God's will, it's predetermined, I'm gonna end this, this is how I'm gonna end up. Or they could say, we're all gonna die anyways, I might just speed it up. So those are the four types of suicide that Durkheim looked at, okay? They're uh, vocabulary words for you to know in an intro to sociology class. The egoism, altruism, anami, and fatalism. Then I have the chart, which you don't get to see. And uh, figure one is Durkheim's paradigm of suicide. And he has all these arrows connecting those sort of four things, the, the society, individual, and there's all these arrows connected. But the point to take from this, even though you can't see it, in this chart, the arrows are going one way. Society, individual. So which is like society influences individual. Individual influences behavior. So there are all these unidirectional arrows. And then in this other chart, there are, there are going two ways. So it's like society influences the individual, individual influences society. So the difference there is causality and correlation. So if you have unidirectional arrows, that would say that society causes the individual to do something. And if you have direct uh, arrows that go in two ways, that's correlation. Society causes the individual to do something, and then the individual does it as a part of society. So you can look at anything this way. Remember, this is theory, you know, week two, this is theory. So we're starting to learn theory. And the difference you need to take home from tonight is causality and correlation. So we'll go back to suicide, we'll go back to summer crime rates, we'll go back to birth rates, and think about things that cause other things or things that are correlated with other things. So does summer heat cause people to just get angry? Maybe it causes them to get angry, and then they go and shoot people. Or does it just so happen that there's more opportunity to commit crimes in the summer? So it's not that summer causes crime, it's just that these things both occur at the same time. So if you say, well, all these moms and dads are having kids on, or they're you know, getting ready to have kids on February 14th, and the cause is the national holiday, then you would be a positivist. You would say that A causes B. But if you say, well, this is just totally random, all these kids seem to be born between November 1st and November 15th. Well, it's not random, but it, it relates to the time of year. So that's a correlation. So you can either be a positivist, A causes B. You're gonna say cause a lot. Or you can be a relativist, A is related to B, and these things kind of line up. So right now, taking it back to the crime rate and the incarceration thing, 
Positivism is dangerous because right now the rates of incarceration for African Americans are off the charts. So if you're a positivist, you would say African Americans do more crime because they're African Americans. You'd say A leads to B. A causes B. They're African Americans. That means they commit crimes. That means they go to jail. That would be a positivist thing. But if you were a relativist, you would say these variables contribute to the outcome, which is the incarceration rates. So you would say, well, African American, oh, there's more, the proportion of Caucasian cops is higher. And the rates of poverty are higher for African Americans. And so if you add those things up, a bunch of white cops, a bunch of impoverished African Americans, then that's going to lead to more crimes because they're going to be um, engaging in behaviors like burglary, larceny, um, drug use, um, drinking, drinking and driving, public intoxication, and the person that enforces the laws is going to be all white. And so, of course, you know, that's going to happen. A didn't cause B, but A is related to B because of these factors. So as you move forward and you develop your theories, and we talk next week about theories, what you want to remember is, is A related to B? And can I kind of fix that and change that? Or does A cause B? And that's sort of a positive and a, a definite, definite outcome. So are there things that we can change? Are there things that are natural? Is it a causation? Is it a correlation? A causation is a positivist. A correlation is going to be a relativist. So these are the things you need to think about moving forward. And just remember, I showed a Kurt Cobain video. Remember, take from this suicide and go home and think, is suicide caused by something? If so, is it caused by an individual's behavior and actions? Is it caused by society? Is suicide just related to a social situation? That if you put anyone in that social situation, that would equate to, to suicide or result in suicide? Is it related? Is it caused? Is it caused by the individual? Is it caused by society? Or is all this just not even matter? It's totally random. And your theory could be the, the random theory or whatever. Uh, I don't think you guys are going to present on that next week. So that was my presentation on Durkheim's uh, paradigm. It was an article I took from the 1983 first edition of Sociological Theory. And you have access to that through SVSU Library. Um, I hope you got something out of it because um, in a regular sociology class, I would have you read 100 pages of Durkheim and it would put you all to sleep. So I hope that you just take what's important parts of tonight's lesson, the suicide thing, the causation and correlation thing, the crime rate thing, and the birth rate thing. Go home and think, well, don't go home yet. We'll go home later and think about it. So as we go off into the 9-11 thing too, I want you to think about that. Did we do something that caused them to attack us? Or was there no stopping it? They just did it because of the social situation, international relations, and because you can't escape conflict. Because the whole world, all social relations are based in conflict. And that was just an extreme conflict. So think about that as we move forward, as we experience the whole 9-11 thing um, tonight and every year for the rest of our lives. We'll have to remember that. So it is 8.05. Go ahead. What's our essay supposed to We do the same stuff, so I have to repeat myself a lot. Um, and the first students that presented, outstanding. So they set the bar very high for you. And it's, this is your competitor down the road. You're all going to graduate together and enter the job market. So they've got it going on. So you guys have to, you know, show what's up with the red pride, right? The Prezi thing, that'll probably do good there. Their uh, presentation involved symbolic interactionism, conflict theory, and functionalism. Any of you doing those things? Yeah, oh, it's very common. And like I told them, uh, I specifically don't lecture out of the book because I kind of think you do. And this is a sociological experiment, sort of, in that it's really shifting the paradigm for education that your information you used to get only from me, right? Back 10, 20 years ago, students come to the lecture to get the information from the professor. Oh, professor, teach me these great things, right? 
But now, um, those same slideshows that would have happened 10, 20 years ago about conflict theory, functionalism, and be reviewing six journal articles for your midterm, it's all just so available. And your books are online. You know, I had to go buy books. You had to buy books back in the day. Now your books are free and online. And, and back in the day, no professor ever lectured from note cards that he had on his smartphone. Um, since I'm thinking about when I was in college, I, did, I will tell you um, just a, a very brief anecdote about my experience with September 11th. I, I was actually in class on the morning of September 11th. I was in a class called Religion and Revolution. The, when the, the planes hit the towers, I was in a class called Religion and Revolution. And it was really impactful for me because it was at that point in my life, I think I really started realizing how important education was because here I am in a, one of the most life-changing events for America you know in the past as long as I can remember and um, it was based a lot on you know religion um, even if it wasn't specifically a Muslim you know dictate um, the countries over there are heavily based on Islam and like here, all of our presidents have been Protestant Christian, except for one. Does anyone know who that was? JFK. So even though our religion's not necessarily based on religion, we have Christianity embedded in our leaders and somewhat in our constitution. And so over there, they have the same thing with Islam. And so to be in a class called Religion and Revolution, when an attack like that was happening, country on country, which was related to religion and a revolution, I thought, you know, this is really appropriate. A really important place to be is at school. Sometimes you can look at school as like math class and this boring English class uh, talking about Shakespeare that you don't like and will never read again. But what you should really do is grab onto these opportunities like this nine o'clock thing where you go and you recognize the world we live in. So it's a very important um, thing to do when you're in college. And that was very, you know, obviously 9-11 is a big impact, but to be sitting in a class called Religion and Revolution when that happened, it's just, it's like, this is really the place where we should be. So I'm going to continue to be here as long as they'll <coughs> hire me. So this week's about theory, but I don't take um, my lectures from the book because I figure that you probably get a lot from the book or from the internet or whatever. So what I do is I find a good article um, online. Uh, it's free. You can go to the SVSU library on the web page. You just log in. Your tuition pays for this. Maybe you don't know that. But uh, we have subscriptions here through the library, which is coincidentally right there, to academic journals. And I just found a good one that I thought was pretty broad, pretty basic. And it's from, in fact, a journal called Sociological Theory. So there you go, right? And um, it was also from the first edition. So you'd think they're starting a journal in 1983 called Sociological Theory. The first couple articles are going to probably be relatively broad. Relatively, no pun intended. Um, so this one was pretty good. It talks a lot about Durkheim, but uh, I'm doing like your stuff. I'm doing theory. We're going to come at it from different perspectives. I also teach on Mondays an intro class at Delta College down the street. and. Um, Last night, they did one. We were in symbolic interactionism, game theory maybe, um, and network theory. You're teaching the class, so the whole thing is shifted because the information is now available to you in a lot of different ways. In fact, information has kind of been democratized as we will we'll learn more about what democratized and democracy means with a small d, not Democrats, um, throughout the semester. But now you have the access to information, so you have a lot more power than you used to 10, 20 years ago as students. Um, in the past, you used to come here sort of in need of the information from me, but now you all have it, and I just give you extra information. So the, the fact is, students today are coming out so much smarter than when I came out. So the fact that you're going to school now instead of 15 years ago, it's actually you're getting a better quality education it's amazing. I mean, I remember when I was in college, and we were right around the same age, as far as college goes, pretty close. And uh, I remember 
being in class and, uh, you know, I didn't even, we didn't have online journals. I never read a journal article. And now you'll all.